Scott Wolf. Three years ago, he sold his company Level Set for half a billion dollars. Excited and relieved at first, he soon found himself deeply frustrated with the reality that his vision for the business would now never be realized. We made so much progress toward a vision. I knew where it was going and it just got taken out of my hands. I feel unfinished business there. Like I'll, 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 part of that, it makes me want to jump back into it in some way. Um, but it's like you can't, you can't quite get those ingredients together again. Like I'm gonna have to do a new dish now. I can't do that dish. I feel a lot of frustration with that. Scott is a natural creative who sees building a business as an artistic endeavor. It was this intrinsic need to create that sustained him through the grueling journey of building his business. Post exit, he misses being driven by that vision and working alongside his exceptional, organically built team, one he feels can never be recreated. In this conversation, we explore the pros and cons of starting a sequel, the paradox of purpose, being a true hedgehog, the need for authenticity, full-time parenting and raising entrepreneurial children. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was my pleasure. So you had a big exit uh, three years ago. Can we go back to that moment and tell me how you felt when the company was sold? I mean, well, one thing is it's a lot of mixed feelings. Everybody probably experiences a lot of mixed feelings with that. I was really proud of the company when it was sold. I was very happy. I thought that um, I, I had a lot of, I guess, high highs in that moment. It was a whirlwind. It was fun, um, but also a little bit of um, a little bit of anxiety around like, well, something's leaving your hands that was in your hands, and there's a little bit of anxiety about that, and you're optimistic about it. Yeah. Um, but but a, a little anxious. But for the most part, I mean, it was a really high high. It was the culmination of a lot of work, and I kind of remember remember or I remember um, noticing that it was the top of the mountain for this, this part, this, this particular asset, this particular journey and appreciate it. And I had fun. I loved it. How did that feeling change over the past three years? There, I think there was probably some anxiety afterwards. That feeling changed in the shorter term, like in maybe the 12 month term after it into more of, um, more of the feeling of loss that maybe I was predicting or worrying that I might have. Um, so then you start to feel the loss of what you had before. Um, there's a lot of identity wrapped up in that. So I, I was starting to question, you know, where I belong in, in, in that company in in the world. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't know if the, the, and what's funny is even though you have a little bit of loss, a little bit of grief, a little bit of identity complex, a little bit of, um, um, sadness and, and frustration at times, really, real a lot of frustration with something that you had a vision for and that you are, that you were the author of kind of going in directions that maybe can frustrate you kind of like, um, it was like a child going to yeah. college and, you know, you're starting to wear clothes you don't like them to wear and go out later than you like them to go out. Would you say it's, it's, it's a loss of control that bothered you, that you could no longer have a say on what happened to your company after the sale? Maybe there was like a degree of that. I think that with respect to that question, it was more about authorship. Mm -hmm. um, it's like if you're a... To me, and I guess every founder, every CEO, every um, leader is a little bit different. But to me, I felt in retrospect, like I was very much an author of a work. I was like a painter mm -hmm. painting a painting. And I had all mm -hmm. this control in a way. It wasn't like I could control what we did in a day, but yeah. I, I, was, I, I was the author of the direction. It was my piece. And yeah. then after that, it isn't the control of of a team or the control of a plan or the control of an objective. It's mm -hmm. more about like, you just, you're, you're not the author anymore. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's, 
you can't write what you want to write exactly you can't paint what you want yeah. to paint exactly yeah no no i i completely understand would you generally say that business is a form of art i think for so. you personally yeah i think and when i think about what i enjoy doing what i enjoyed about the process of building the company it was a lot a lot of it was um a lot of it was design it was a design job mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was an art job. Um, and more than it was, um, corporate. I very much can relate to it. Uh, we both started as attorneys, but then mm -hmm. in my business, I also definitely loved the creativity and saw it as a, a channel for my creativity and then very much missed, uh, exactly that. So I, yeah. I know. I know what you're talking about. So going back to your being an attorney first, uh, how did that transition go for you? It was, it was really smooth. Um, I was a weird attorney in the sense that I wasn't exactly expecting to become an attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to law school, so I knew I was going to get a law license, but I was doing it sort of in connection with a family business that my, my parents had. Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't, I wasn't, necessarily going to go practice. But when I got my law license that like the month after I took the bar exam, Hurricane Katrina came and hit New Orleans and sort of mm -hmm. flipped the family business on its head. Mm -hmm. And I found myself open in a law firm that focused on construction law and insurance law mm -hmm. um, and helping a lot of the contractors and property owners in New Orleans mm -hmm. um, with the volume of construction. So I was running a firm that I wasn't, I wasn't like, I, all of a sudden I was practicing, but then I was almost, it was my own firm right out of law school. I hung my shingle. And mm -hmm. so before I knew it, I had two or three attorneys working in my office and I was kind of running a business. Yeah. And I had some other businesses I started on the side of that business, one of them being level set. And so I, it was like I was juggling a lot of balls. Everything was everything. There was a lot of activity. And I wasn't an attorney. You know, I didn't get that like traditional sense of an attorney. So the transition to level set was fairly smooth because it was kind of one of I was always having three or four things in my that I was juggling any time. And mm -hmm. level set just started to kind of consume more attention. And so it was pretty smooth. So, so let's talk about level set. How long did it take you to get to an exit? Depends on how you count. Um, <laughs> how do you count? I, uh, I, I say that level set had three beginnings, three foundings. The first founding was around 2008 mm -hmm. when I was two or three years out of law, three years out of law school. It was in the throes of post Katrina, New Orleans. And I had three or four different things that I was doing, law firm being one, my parents restoration company being another. And um, I had, a, I had a, a software development company where I was building little software products. And I built this idea for level set as kind of like a, a turbo tax slash legal zoom process mm -hmm. for construction liens. And so that's when it was originally founded, but it lived on the side of my desk for like mm -hmm. five years. So mm -hmm. from 2008 through 2012, it did fine, but it was just a really, it was a very pet project with the main show being a lot of the other stuff I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, it was in 2012 that um, I had my first child and this little side project was just like, it just called me and it, it, and it, and it was working in a way that I just felt, I felt it working. Mm -hmm. And so level set had its second beginning, which is that I shut off my attention to all the other projects and I mm -hmm. focused exclusively on it. And I ra I started raising, um, I raised a small family friends, angel kind of round of financing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I ran that like that for three years. Cash flow positive, very like mature, very um, conservative growth, and then that got it got a third and final founding in 2012, 15, 
when I started mm -hmm. raising venture capital for yeah. the um, for the company. Then it went through a few rounds of venture capital and sold in 2021. So six years from our first venture capital round, nine years or 10 years from me going exclusively and starting to work on it. And maybe, I don't know, what's that, 14 years, 15 years from its true origination. Yeah, yeah, makes a lot of sense. So, but you had to still grow quite fast because you raised, what, 46 million and you exited for half a billion. So right. that from a little side project on the side of your desk is quite a, uh, yeah. a jump. And yeah, um, we grew, it, it grew very little until 2012. From 2012 to 2015, it grew like, it grew, let's say from 150,000 to like $2 million of revenue. It's yeah. good growth, good, good yeah. fast growth in three years on yeah. very little funding. But then it really took the, the turbo fuel I mean, we raised 46 of the 46 million between 2015 and 2019, mm -hmm. right? So we were really blowing in those four years. For you, when you look back, what do you think your key role was in, in the company? Like what it is you brought to the table that made a difference? I, I mean, if you look at it from a pure corporate talent, I think I was talented in marketing. Okay. And in product roles. Um, and specifically I have a very, I have a knack around like demand generation and, and creating, um, a position and creating brands and, um, and content marketing and con and blending the, like, blend, I like to say blending the differences between product and marketing, a, a phrase I would use all, all the time is everything is marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the product, I, I like looking at companies like Zillow and mm -hmm. saying, Hey, whose product and who's marketing at Zillow. Mm -hmm. And it, it's really hard to tell because they're so overlapping, right? The product itself yeah. creates, um, the marketing. So I think from a corporate talent standpoint, it's somewhere in those things. Mm -hmm. Um, when I think about what I brought as a leader, I think I brought a lot of enthusiasm for mm -hmm. this particular um, point of view. I brought a mm -hmm. point of view, a strong point of view, mm -hmm. and a lot of enthusiasm behind it in a category that I really start, that I really understood well. Yeah. Um, and I think so in that regard, uh, my enthusiasm and point of view mm -hmm. was super important to everything kind of finding its way to the accomplishments that we had. The reason I ask you this question, Scott, is because I'm trying to understand how your understanding of your role in the first business then translated into your current business, because you already started another one, right? Technically, um, but it's living on the side of my desk a okay. lot like <laughs> a lot like Level Set did uh, for five years okay. back in the day. Yeah. Okay. So it's tech technically there's another business there. Why are you dragging your feet? One reason is I'm not sure I want to do it again. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember how hard it was to build level set and um, I'm not sure I want to do it again at all. And okay. I think about what if I did it and I spent 15 years doing it or 10 and I had a great outcome Oh, they give me another ribbon. I put the ribbon right here. Be like, hey, he did it again. You know, like, what's the point? Um, that's one reason. I'm not sure if I want to do it. The other thing is um, I've been very, maybe maybe it's a little bit of my own fear of, of like sticking my neck out again. Maybe it is um, the pressure of having such a successful outcome the first time and, and not, mm -hmm. not necessarily knowing how to re-enter the world, um, at a ground zero again. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, all, but I, I, I see, I have like three kids. They're, they're non 11 and 13, very freshly non 11 and 13. Mm -hmm. And I think what if I didn't do anything until my nine year old was 12 or 13, that's like three or four years now, I'd still be able to do something. I'd still be young. Um, 
But if I did work for the next three or four years on this new business and like threw everything I had into it, mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's a, a pretty significant chance of me maybe regretting that I didn't take those four years and just mm -hmm. like breathe. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm apprehensive about getting too far into something mm -hmm. um, in while, while I have a young family at home in a, in a time when I'm like, I, I, I got the, I have the opportunity to, to not go work that hard on, yeah. on something. I mean, not everybody has to work that hard all the time. <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're very wise uh, because uh, three years is is a very short period of time. You need to to go th through that process. And frankly, I am very happy to hear that you're not rushing into big commitments yet, because what I see a lot, if you zoom out, actually, and you look at uh, stories of exited founders, what I see again and again is that people rush into something very quickly because they just can't tolerate the discomfort of not yeah. having a business or not being busy or having to actually introspect, God forbid. Um, and they yeah. rush <laughs> rush into something very quickly. And then a few years later, it, they regret it and it's very hard to undo. So yes. what I found is that it actually takes a decade for people to just adjust to new reality, which is fascinating because nobody expects that. People think, oh, you know, in a few months, I'll be fine. But it's not actually true. If if you commit to something in a few months, most likely you'll spend years undoing it. And you don't know what you want. Like, I don't know. I really don't know what I want. I don't know if I want to start another company. I think I know how to start another company. And I think I can. But maybe a joke I like to say is maybe I want to be a stand-up comic. Like, I don't know. I don't know if I don't want to be a Like, I don't know. I have the opportunity, which is unique, to do anything mm -hmm. that I want, um, which makes it a little harder. I read um, a somewhere about Peyton Manning, who you may know because you're in London. You may know Peyton Manning. You know who that is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't know. So he was a you know, he retired when he retired from football, and I always think it's fascinating how people retire from professional sports because they mm -hmm. always retire very young and they literally been doing it since they're like, you know, five years old. Yeah. So I always think it's fascinating. What do they do when that just goes away? And um, Peyton Manning's old coach told them to spend the year not doing anything and just mm -hmm. to figure out what he doesn't, what he doesn't want to do. Yeah. Right. Like figure out the things you don't want to do. Um, and, but it's definitely a challenge. And so I, I found that to be, kind of wise. And I've been trying to make sure I don't um, jump into anything. Yeah. Um, but it is definitely challenging. Yeah. So you, you described why you wouldn't start a business. It's because you already know how hard it is. You know how much pain and sacrifice uh, that requires. It takes a long time. It takes you away from the family and uh, you want to be there for your kids in the next few years. Now, can you try to be a devil's advocate and actually tell me why you would do it? You don't really accomplish anything or discover anything by sitting on your back porch on a rocking chair. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't start level set from a rocking chair thinking, hmm, what kind of business, what kind of things could I do with my life? Mm -hmm. Hmm, what kind of business could I start? Life kind of got thrust onto me, right? I had Hurricane Katrina. My, my, house, had, my house was flooded. I had businesses popping up all over the place. I was active. I was in, mm -hmm. I was in the, the, the stream. And so being introspective and thinking is um, fun in ways, but it's, it's not in the stream. And I'm not going to discover what I'm not going to discover like a calling or a mission or a purpose, or I'm not going to discover like healthy, fulfilling work mm -hmm. by sitting on my porch on my rocking chair. Yeah. So one reason to start a business or to get is to get in the stream and just start plugging away at something that some little crack in the universe that you think you see some art you want to some some art you want to create um, mm -hmm. like put so if painting you need a, you need a paint you write in you need to write. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is that I do have like an impulse to uh, create. Uh, that's what I, uh, as, far, as far as I really remember, I created little businesses and created little concepts. Mm -hmm. And I have an impulse to, to do it. That's why this other thing exists. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, I, and that other thing, if you, if you looked into it at all, it, it relates very much to my background. It, it is not, it's not like I sat around thinking about what would be a good business. This mm -hmm. is a, something that I kind of, it was, it's one of the threads of my life that I keep pulling on. Yeah. And I have an impulse to work on it. Mm -hmm. So I, that's another reason to start it is because that is my, my impulse. Um, and the third, the other reason is just to have the, just to, just to, just to, just to, just to hear the gunfire, right? Just to hear the, the sound of the gunfire of going do something else. Whereas otherwise you're kind of in like this paralysis of not doing something. Mm -hmm. And then you, the longer you don't do anything, the, the more foreign it becomes. Yeah. Our, our skills can atrophy. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's of course a concern. Okay. So, so you basically feel you want to have this sense of fulfillment, which I assume running a business used to give you and sense of purpose. And uh, you have this uh, creativity and this inner need uh, that needs to, to be realized. It needs to be channeled and needs to become something, right? Um, it's, it's inside of you. So would you say you, you're la lacking a sense of purpose? Would that be the right description of it? I hate to say it because, like, I have, um, like, I have a lot of, my, I have a, I have, a, I have a lot of family to deal with, right? Like I have things, I have, yeah. I have a, I have purpose. So you hate to say that you lack purpose, but the answer I think is yes. Like I, I lack a, um, I lack a. I think it's maybe it's not that. There is something around identity and purpose and these terms, but the other thing that I I feel like that I quite don't have my hand around is that I don't feel like I'm building anything mm -hmm. um, or I don't feel like I'm, I'm, um, I'm creating anything. Yeah. And so, yeah. and I think about, I've thought about this a good bit where if you have a person like, um, like Stephen King, who's written so much um, and like, what could possibly be the purpose of him writing another book? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, he has so many things he's written. He's probably fine. Just not writing anything. Like it isn't, it doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. like, except that he needs yeah, to. Except he needs to do it. He, he needs to write the book because mm -hmm. he, 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 so there's something in that, that I think mm -hmm. I'm missing. To me, it would be part of your purpose because the purpose is the reason we're here, right? It's our biggest desire that probably stems from the very reason we're here. And if that creativity is inside of you, um, then that's exactly what it is. Like Stephen King is probably here to write those books. Yeah, but he could stop. He, he could also he could also switch and do... Um, he could get into movies or he can get into... Um, he could start a business like there is a lot of purpose to um, like to raising children. Right. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot there. And if I fast forward my life 10 years from now, if I, if I, if I, if I could spring forward 10 years, mm -hmm. it's much more important that those three children and my family be in a, in a great, good position than me to write another book. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and maybe I can find a creative outlet in writing a book or, or something mm -hmm. else besides yeah. building a company. Maybe there's another craft that I want to hone in on. Uh, I, I hear it a lot and I was there as well myself. 
and I call it uh, the paradox of purpose uh, because you want yeah. purpose without the pain, right? You don't want that pain anymore, but you want this uh, rewarding feeling that you are self-realizing for the lack of a better word, but you're doing, right. doing that creative thing that uh, you love doing, right? So uh, right. It's, it's not easy and it's very personal, but um, I think, first of all, nobody said that there should be just one purpose or definitely one purpose in life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with you accepting uh, your parenting as a purpose for this period in your life. While I am getting a lot of fulfillment out of parenting, so to speak, or just being there more, a lot more <laughs> than I was before, um, that still doesn't change. It doesn't, it, it still leaves a lot of like yeah. anxiety and yearning in, in the, there's a lot, you have a lot of time in the day. I used to think I had no time in the day. Exactly. And now I feel like there's a lot of time in the day. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a difficult adjustment. Um, but also, uh, what, what I realized over time for myself and other people is that when we build our business, we essentially build it to satisfy our own needs. Like, for example, what you were talking about, your creativity. But there are also other things. For example, our business actually satisfied our love and belonging and all our other levels of the Maslow pyramid beautifully. And we just got used to it and didn't fully appreciate it until we exited. And then what happens is that the whole pyramid gets shattered. So there are so many conflicting motivations inside of us. There's so much going on. There's so much that needs to be understood and uh, actually fixed and satisfied. And for example, love and belonging that we were getting from the employees and partners and all of it now needs to be satisfied in the family. And it's very unfair and difficult actually to expect. Uh, so I totally understand what you're going through. And I think it's great that you're taking the time because you now need to rebuild that pyramid around something else and family alone will not do it. And I think it's the other thing that's interesting about a company, uh, having your own company, um, that you build is not only do you build it to satisfy all those other things, but you build it to sweet. It's actually, it's actually like perfectly, it starts to fit like a glove in other ways. You can go work somewhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you, but you don't have the ability to make that other place that you work no. fit all your needs like a glove. Everything gets to fit perfectly for you. So it is. And then the other thing that I was there's a few things I was surprised about about exiting, um, and one of them you just said was that it shuts you down to zero. It it doesn't. It isn't like you lose. Um, it isn't like a subtle mm -hmm. descent. Mm -hmm. It's just, sh everything just shuts off like a switch. Yeah. And that is um, a little disconcerting. And the other thing that you don't really appreciate when you're at the top and even at the moment of exit, when everything feels good, you don't appreciate that it's, it's that the day of, it's like, when you're born, it's like I'm born November 6th, 1980. Mm -hmm. And then my death day is blank, right? No one tells you necessarily your death day. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like that business too. Don't quite, you always know it's going to end in some way. Mm -hmm. You don't quite know it's going to end on November 2nd, mm -hmm. which is when ours end. Mm -hmm. And even though I knew I was, I didn't choose to sell it directly. I, I wasn't looking to sell it on November 2nd. It just happened that way. Mm -hmm. If you would ask me on February 2nd, whether of that year, whether it, my whole journey at level set was going to end on November 2nd, I would have thought that that wasn't the case. Like I would, I would have been, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I wasn't expecting it. Talking about death, an interesting topic. Uh, what I hear every now and then is that some people, after they sell a business, especially after l many years, 
they have this fear of death because they actually face their own mortality as well. When we are busy, we don't think about it. When we are not busy, suddenly all these scary thoughts come to our head. Did you experience that? No, but maybe uh, an analog to that is that when you are in the throes of running a business at the level that I was running it, it's not that I'm not thinking about death. It's just that I feel like so much of the world is spinning with me. Um, and when you sell and you exit and you're gone, it's kind of like you shot into outer space mm -hmm. and you're, and you're, you're just floating up there and you watch everything still turn and every, and, and it's not turning with you anymore. And it didn't make me think about death, so to speak, but it did make me reorient my place in life, like in the world mm -hmm. where, uh, you know, after death, the world's going to be just fine <laughs> okay. and the world's going to, and the world's going to go on. And I think you get a glimpse of that when you exit a company, um, because you, in a way, the world and business and the market you were in that you were really, you know, plugged into, mm -hmm. it all goes on mm -hmm. and you're just floating out there in a sort of irrelevance. Mm -hmm. And that that's why I think I can, I can see the analogy. I never did feel it in a, like in a, so you, you see it more as a humility lesson, it sounds like, that the world goes on without you and that teaches you, you know, the, the laws of the universe in a way. Right. And I knew it before, but I never felt it before. Yeah. It's a huge difference between knowing something and actually experiencing it, isn't it? Like if you take, about, right. uh, take the whole post-exit experience, maybe you heard before from your friends that it's not that easy, but until you actually experienced it, you don't know. It's like having kids are falling right. in love, isn't it? And that makes you wonder, man, wow, do I, do I even, was it a good idea to do? Mm -hmm. Was it a good idea to, to, to die like this? Yeah. Um, do you ever regret it? Versus, or, or would you rather live in, would you rather, would you rather live in um, the ignorance of bliss, the bliss of ignorance? Because yeah. you don't know that you die, that it's over yet. I don't, I, I regret selling it in different ways, um, but I also don't regret selling it in different ways. Mm -hmm. So I can't tell, maybe, maybe my regret is more appropriately described as just grief of it being like over and mm -hmm. being gone. Um, mm -hmm. But it had to, I mean, that, that grief was going to come at some point in some form. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the, the, the decision to sell was so sound, mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, the information that I had, I, did I do, and, and what I, what I wish, there's a lot of things that I wish would be different. Um, there's things about the, there's things about the, the fate of the, of the assets mm -hmm. after the acquisition mm -hmm. that. You know, it's not, it's not my art piece. I don't necessarily like who's, I don't necessarily like where it is on the wall. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't like, yeah. I don't like the placement. I think if you went just higher, if you just, yeah. this, so those things are troublesome. They're aggravating, mm -hmm. but it's hard to conflate. I don't want to conflate regret with it. It's, there's this too much positive that came out of the transaction. It was too good of a decision mm -hmm. financially um, for not just me, but for lots of people mm -hmm. it's and career wise for so many people, it's so hard to regret it. Um, but there's a lot of other feelings of, uh, you know, there's a lot of other feelings that can, can simulate regret. No, of course. What do you miss most? I feel like I have unfinished business in the space. Mm hmm and that's probably the thing that aggravates me the most. I don't know if that's missing it the most, mm -hmm. but with the, we built, we made so much progress toward a vision and 
I, I knew where it was going, right? And I, I still know where I would take it and what I would do with it. And it just got taken out of my hands. Mm. And I feel unfinished business there. Like I'll, 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 part of that, it makes me want to jump back into it in some way. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like, you can't, you can't quite get those ingredients together again. Like I'm going to have to do a new dish now. I can't do that yeah. dish. Yeah. As an artist, you basically see your piece not being ever finished and somebody else playing with it right. in ways you don't approve. Yeah. Right. That must be super and, frustrating. Um, I miss being challenged in a way. Um, I like not being challenged now in some ways. I could feel mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of peace in the um, mm -hmm. in my way of life now. Uh, but but I but I definitely feel a different pace of like of growth in the. I was growing and getting better at this job. Mm -hmm. And I miss people. I miss the people the most, probably. I miss like the people that we were yeah. working together with the most. When I, when I really reflect on it, mm -hmm. it's like um, I read a good book or an okay book called "The Monk and the Riddle" mm -hmm. about um, starting companies and ending companies. And he said that when when he sold his company, the true downside of the deal hit him, mm -hmm. which was that they were never going to be like this group of people were not going to be able to work together mm -hmm. anymore to build that thing. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when I, when I bring all, when I start going through my mind and thinking about what do I miss, I guess I come to probably to that, which is I really mm -hmm. miss the, the group that we built and mm -hmm. the, we, we were, we were working together as a great team. And now that team doesn't get to work together again ever. So how do you think that can be replaced? There's a few versions of it being replaced. You can, you can really replace it in that you can get build another team right mm -hmm. like you can you can go build another team and have another experience and another journey mm -hmm. and um it won't ever i mean it'll never be that 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 team it will mm -hmm. never be that journey mm -hmm. so you can't that that's gone yeah right i mean that, that that's completely gone and never to be assembled again and mm -hmm. so you can do it again um, and that, that gets back to kind of like the very beginning of our conversation of a reason to do it again. Mm -hmm. Um, but then that one's going to be gone too, you know, you know, like, yeah. like that one's going to disappear as well. Yeah. So I can do it three times. I can do it four times. Let's say I'm lucky enough to do it twice or three times. Um, I will appreciate, I, I can't, I can't quite figure out to myself whether the journey is the thing that is worth it. Is it like, if I need it, that if I need it to do it, if I need to do it again, because I want to replace that, that not replace it. I want to have it again. You know, I have a, like Jerry Seinfeld said, he said, I don't know why people are argue. I don't know why people are so worried about spoiling your appetite. I keep getting new appetites. I'm never going to run out of appetites. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll never run out of the appetite to have the journey again and again and again and again. And I can keep like sharpening my tools and I can keep going to work and yeah. carrying my little lunchbox and, and, and doing it. Um, or maybe I can find another journey mm -hmm. in another, in another, in another medium. Um, I think about people like Steve Martin, who, you know, he's, he's a stand up comic for, he reaches the, 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 the mountaintop of stand up comedy. He goes, man, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going <laughs> yeah. to go write novels. Yeah. As long as you're ready for the learning curve, uh, to learn something brand new from the start. Sure. So are you experimenting with anything? Because one thing I, I often talk to, uh, talk to talk about with other exited founders yeah. is that we find ourselves, um, very, with very narrow experiences uh, in life yeah. when we've spent so much time going very deep, very narrowly on our business. And there is this, there is this desire to catch up, but also to see what else is out there and, and experiment and explore. It's hard when you have kids yeah. of your age. Um, so you can't just, you know, start yeah. running around exploring yeah. life, but I'm still curious if you are doing something in that direction. 
this particular age bracket of my children, they, there's just so many activities that they, it's like, it's like a constant, they're interruption machines, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So it does make it hard to have a lot of uninterrupted space, which is part. And, and the other thing that is different about my founding of level set and some of the other things is when I founded level set, I was in the stream. I was doing five or six different things mm -hmm. in the stream of, of, a, of an industry of industries. And now I'm not in any stream, mm -hmm. right? Because you're just throwing out, like you're throwing out like, like, like an old Western film where they throw you out of the bar, <laughs> right? And you, and you land, you just land on the outside and you're like, all right, yeah. now what do I do? Um, I'm playing with, another company concept, mm -hmm. right? So I, I've been toying with that. That gets me, um, that, that is a little experimentation. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been, I've been experimenting with like writing. Mm -hmm. Um, I did a lot of writing during level set in a different way. Um, so I've been experimenting with that. Um, and the rest of things that I've been playing with has been more maybe like hobby ish mm -hmm. style, mm -hmm. um, spending more time I've been spending time with like, spend like spend a lot. Of, I've been, I've been saying yes, as much as I can with the family. Yeah. So talking about your writing, talking about your writing, that, that article of yours that I love about the vision. You wrote it um, about a year after your exit, so I assume you you were in the in the process of processing your your experience of building a business, and uh, I think it's brilliant. And you talk about how to form a vision for for a company. Could we quickly yeah. talk about that, and then I want to see how that translated for your own uh, into your own vision for yourself. It, which gets into the reason why I write a lot of things is I was, I had a particular person I was working with who was frustrating me <laughs> um, because there was something about the, um, I mean, when I built level set and built the vision out, I didn't exactly like construct it according to a framework that I had in mind. Mm -hmm. But when I was, helping. And that's one thing that I've been spending a decent chunk of time on since the exit is kind of helping other companies and various like arm's length roles of advisor or board mm -hmm. member or helper. Um, and I don't like when I find people that are doing it differently or wrong. And I can't tell which one it is, mm -hmm. right? Is it wrong or is it different? Yeah. Um, and so I get frustrated. And, and so that particular article that I wrote was born out of um, being frustrated with how I saw someone else failing at setting a vision, mm -hmm. which had me reflect on, you know, what does vision even mean and how do you put it together in a company? And then I kind of assembled that article. Mm -hmm. And I have a few things I've written in article wise that kind of run that same course, like noticing something, getting frustrated and then reflected on, well, how did I do it? And how does mm -hmm. this make sense? Um, I, with like the company that us, this little company toy that I'm playing with now, I very naturally, if I were to take that little framework that I put together and start looking at it with this toy, it, it, it matches perfectly it, because it, it's kind of like my, it's just, the way that I, the way that I build something mm -hmm. follows the way that I think about this company. The moment that it it hatches from the egg, I mm -hmm. think about it in this way. The, these segments, this this way of thinking about the vision. Mm -hmm. um, I, I should maybe I'll go read that article now and you bring it up and think about it with respect to my life because I don't I, I didn't apply it that way. Let's talk about a few practical things. So when you had your exit, f from the financial standpoint, was it a life changing event for you? Yes. How did you react to it? Because uh, there is a, quite a well known phenomena called sudden wealth syndrome, when people go quite crazy, when they suddenly become wealthy, 
and uh, have extreme fee of losing money and all of that. Did you did you experience any of that? Unfortunately, no. It sounds like a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I might have had, I might have had a great time. That's what I should have done. <laughs> um, I ta- I had talked to a few people who had a similar event, um, and my instinct was to be slow and mm-hmm. to make sure that I went slow. So one thing that was interesting, on the one hand, it didn't feel like anything at all from the standpoint of one day you have not that much money. And then the other day you have a whole lot of money Mm -hmm. and I didn't, that, that, that particular feeling was very dull to me. Mm -hmm. I did not feel much there on the other side. I, my instinct was to do nothing. I don't know why, but my instinct was that Mm -hmm. I wanted it all to have time. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to go invest in things. I was very, um, I was very cautious about making any decisions at all. Did it, call, did it cause you stress? Were you calmly cautious or you were just very scared? No, I wasn't scared. I was calmly cautious. Mm-hmm. I, was, I was intellectually cautious. I knew that it was a different mm-hmm. thing having that much money. I knew that I didn't know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. necessarily like I had and I knew that I had to um learn more mm-hmm. before I just started shooting from the hip and saying I'm going to do this and this and this um and I did I, I I I learned a lot about wealth in that 12 or 24 month period mm-hmm. I very slowly dragged my feet with applying any of the money to any investments mm-hmm. um, and I found my way into I think like advisors that I trusted, I found my way into investments that I understood mm-hmm. and, um, and have like a pretty conservative uh, approach to it that has worked. And I also didn't go and do, um, I didn't buy anything. Mm-hmm. I don't think I bought anything. Scott, I'm so impressed. I never, I never hear things like that. I'm really impressed because most of the people I interview, they say, oh yeah, absolutely. You go down before you go up financially after an exit because you make all these mistakes. And I'm one of those people. I made lots of mistakes. I <laughs> angel invested for fun <laughs> and, and yeah. to, to, to get my identity back for all their own reasons and uh, made an Im- impulsive thing. So I'm, I'm very impressed you had the wisdom to, to not do that. I feel good about that. I don't feel like I went down. I don't feel like I, I made mistakes. Well, I, I won't say I didn't make mistakes. I feel like I didn't make anything that, that, that I, don't have, I don't have regrets there. Mm-hmm. I did still, there's still a few like things that I did to like you mentioned angel investments. I didn't make a lot of, I knew from the beginning, I didn't want to be an angel investor mm-hmm. because I'm not an investor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm very, I'm very like, I, I'm not, I'm not an investor. Why would I go? People spend their career trying to be investors. Yeah. Why would I take my money, which I put all this risk behind mm-hmm. to go risk it? I don't need to risk it. I can go put it into, um, I don't need to risk it. So I had that feeling. But still, the number of people right after that exit, that the number of groups and whatever that kept knocking on the door to um, it was it was it was it was hard to say no to them all. Yeah. How did you go about that? Dragging my feet. And that's kind of been like my 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 best friend is Mm -hmm. dragging my feet. Um, And then I did like get sucked into a few of them at very small levels. So when I when I would. Mm-hmm. get like forced. It almost felt like it was charity. I, I treated it like charity actually. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the one, the ones that I invested in that I actually thought of it kind of like, I felt like I was almost having to do it as charity. Yeah. Um, a lot of local stuff like new Orleans based stuff and things in the ecosystem that did a lot for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. so I, I looked at it as charity and, um, and then eventually I learned how to even not do that. 
Yeah. Right? How, how, like, how to just say no. And ways that I say no now is I invest in um, a few funds mm-hmm. that I have relationships with and that are in my categories. And now it's very easy for me to um, like, you know, take a lot of that inbound in the, all those inputs and direct them into, mm-hmm. all right, well, look, I think that you be a match for this fund. Go to the investors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but that's a very, that's like a very tricky area, I think, for people who exit. Yeah. Um, it was even, it was tricky for me and I had a pretty firm point of view about it. You know, uh, our mutual friend who introduced us, who was also your investor, Honam, uh, prefers to invest in hedgehogs, right? And hedgehogs are people who are very good at something, one thing, and that they, they do it very well. Also, as he explained it uh, to me a couple of weeks ago, there's another side when a hedgehog sells a company, that person can still be a hedgehog as long as the next thing they do, they don't do for money. So I now understand why he considers you a hedgehog. Otherwise, he wouldn't invest into you (laughs) because you do have this amazing rare ability to really understand what you're good at and not try to chase all these other goals and things. Ho is always such a wise investor yeah, and a wise counsel on the board. Um, and whether uh, I probably even honed my hedgehog eatiness <laughs> further with, with Ho there as a nice echo, mm-hmm. um, be on it, but I definitely do. I, I, I feel I have a lot of, um, perspective overlap with Ho around that, which is you can't eat. And even at level set, besides me personally, mm-hmm. what well, at level set, I really wanted to focus the company on what it was, its hedgehog concept. Yes. And I got, I got a lot of this from um, being such a big fan of this book that I read when I was like 12 years old around mm-hmm. positioning. Mm-hmm. And, um, I think there's so much, whether the success of a company, the success of a person around understanding who you are, Mm -hmm. who you're not and, and, and digging into that. And, um, I don't, I, I get turned off when I, when I see it's interesting because after an exit, that's an interesting thing to put like after uh, interesting thing to bring up around hedgehogs because after the exit, I think there is a lot of pressure that comes to do a, for people that expect you that want to, want you to do a lot of things. Yeah. Right. They expect you to, in my case, there was all these expectations or things being thrown at you about all the things that I could do. Mm-hmm. And I still feel this way. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot of things I can do and it's a lot of strange pressure around like, all the, the paradox of choice to use the term paradox yeah. again, right? When you have all these yeah. choices, it's paralyzing. And when you look at what people do after an exit, mm-hmm. or when you look at what people do after they like, after they really make it, there's a, there's, there's only so many categories. Like they could become a coach. They could be a mentor. Mm-hmm. They can become, um, they can go become an investor. They can go into charity and philanthropy. Um, they could go into, um, you know, there's all, there's all these different lanes mm-hmm. of second purpose, but mm-hmm. it's an interesting thought from Ho that w- any of these lanes, oh, you can go do a, another business again. You can do it. You can run the, you can run the tape again. Whatever you do, just go, just remember what it was that made you successful to begin with, which yeah. is that you. Yeah. It's like the old City Slickers movie. The secret to life is one thing. Are you remember that from City Slickers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Scott, there is a reason I asked you before about uh, sort of options that you are looking at. Because maybe that whole Steve Martin's path of switching between very different activities are not, is not for you. Because maybe you're a proud hedgehog. No, but I think that's not, I don't know that's true. I think Steve Martin is a proud hedgehog. Okay. If you, if you, if you study him, he just hedgehogs 
into different things. And all of them were art. Okay. You know, they're all art. Mm -hmm. But he was a stand up comic and he and he like dug that hole and he was reached the top. And then he's then he went into writing. Mm -hmm. And then he went into music. And they're all like similar. They're all in the same category. Mm -hmm. But but he never did them all at the same time. He went he would go really deep. Given that for you, business is art, all the other arts are open for consideration. Why not? And you yeah, can still sure. be a proud hedgehog and Ho will be happy. Right. right. Ho would be happy. Um, yeah, that's right. In, in a way, I think that's correct. I don't think I'm an art. I don't think art is necessarily the, the exact Place. But a lot of people go into, I was mentioning the things that people go into, which is um, teaching, mm -hmm. philanthropy, a, a lot of people go into expression, right? Mm -hmm. Into different types of, of artistic ex expression. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that that's a, it's possible in, um, and a lot of what I did as CEO and found in the company a lot of times I was a teacher mm -hmm. and a coach, mm -hmm. right? Which is that teacher lane. A lot of times I was um, in expression lane. I was writing a lot mm -hmm. as a CEO and, and, and I was um, creating a lot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's a lot of times I was investing. Mm -hmm in a different way. So all those things can be done again in the context of, I'm going to take a company and do it. Or is there one that I'm drawn to that I said, you know, I was really, I was really good at getting other people to see a vision and to believe a vision mm -hmm. and to work around a vision. And I did that through articulation. And, and you, Keep going back to the idea of a vision in our interview, which for me also signals that there is something there that brings you back yeah. to that. <laughs> Can we talk about kids? Sure. So um, you grew up in a family of entrepreneurs who had a family business. How much that affected your desire to be an entrepreneur? I think it did a lot. Um, I, uh, I, I know that as some examples of how that affected me is that I don't know anybody in my family who wasn't an entrepreneur. I don't know anybody in my family to my uncles and my aunts and my grandparents who ever like filled out a job application somewhere. Mm -hmm. I've never filled out a job application yeah. ever. <laughs> um, so I don't even know what it feels like to work on my resume mm -hmm. to like go work. I don't even, so it, it's, so when you say, does it, did it affect you? I it's, it's, it's like it had to, I don't even know what it's like to yeah. be in a different yeah. um, paradigm. So do you wish, wish that for your kids? Yeah, it's a problem and I've noticed, and it's one of the, if I do have a regret about selling, that is one regret I have about selling, which is again, it's hard to use that term regret, but still I do wish that what they, my kids, what they saw when I was, when I was working at level set and building at level set is they saw me really enjoying what I was doing, me really putting together um, um, something, building something and being an entrepreneur. And now they don't see that. And I don't like that they don't see it. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, when I was growing up, I was actually working in the grocery stores. I was working in the business mm -hmm. and I got a lot of, I got a lot out of that. Mm -hmm. And my kids don't have that at all now. Mm -hmm. And so it does bother me in a way, um, I, I wish that that were different. I do want them to have it. I, I am at a little bit of a loss of how to precisely give it to them. Mm -hmm. I definitely, I mean, 
and I can't go buy a grocery store just to have a place for them to go work after school. Um, and so it is, it is, it is a, a, a something that I think about often. Two of my kids are a bit older than yours, and then one of them is younger. And with the older ones, I actually really wanted them to be entrepreneurial as well. I, I thought it's the right path. I actually had a corporate career in a law firm, unlike you, when I was a lawyer. And I always thought that I don't want my kids to, to go there. So what I did, I actually raised them unemployable. And we'll see if it's a good idea or not. But they, they do both have a business. The older one is already very successful in his business. It's not easy especially when your child becomes completely financially independent at 15, it's actually very, very scary. So I'm not trying to say that this is what parents should do. What I'm trying to say is that shaping their mindset and just letting them see that the entrepreneurial path may be fun and full of freedom may be perfectly enough and they don't need to work in a store. There's nothing specific. There's no, there's 8 billion ways, mm -hmm. right. To, to raise a child. Yeah. There's, there, there's, there's nothing specific about working in a store or whatever. What I think was given to me by having an entrepreneur, having a family of entrepreneurs is I watched these young people. My parents were very young when they had me, my mom was 16, my dad was 18. Oh, wow. So I watched these young people who had no business doing what, like they, they had no rights to do the, um, no credentials, no rights to do what they did. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, but, but was able to just do it. And what I think the lesson that kind of like that, I think that I got and that, that I think, I think my kids get, got when I was doing level set, or at least even now in retrospect doing level set, is that this entrepreneur mindset is just that you can just, you can just do things, you can build things, you can, you can, you mm -hmm. can see something and work on it and produce it. You, there's ways to, to, to get fed and to mm -hmm. succeed and to feel good out of your own hands, to go back to vision, yeah. the ability to trust some picture that you believe that you see mm -hmm. and make it so um mm -hmm. is a a trait that's important to an entrepreneur and i think even important in any any setting versus what i think is the bad because corporate life is doesn't have to be bad but mm -hmm. what i think makes it bad is that you feel like the world is being done to you, that the job is being done to you, mm -hmm. that you're, you know, you're, you can't, you know, when, when like a, when a corporation is dying it, or it's when it's, when it's dead inside is when the people who are working there are clocking in and clocking out and they're never taking anything out of their heads and they're, mm -hmm. they're never seeing a future they want to build and go and work on it. They're just, gone, you know, work on whatever it is in the project spreadsheet for nine to five. And that sometimes becomes a trap for those of us who after an exit uh, become investors and then we invest and that can become just very soulless because there is no beautiful vision yeah. to build towards. Yeah. I think I thought about in like, I think that that's one of the things that I struggle with a lot with investing mm -hmm. is that it's so out of your hands. And so if I wanted to become an investor, I would, and I thought about this, I would have to create a point of view. Mm -hmm. Like what's my point of view about the, the impact in the, in the world or an industry or something that I would need to make. Mm -hmm. And then through that point of view, I'd come up with a strategy and a thesis and I'd come up with like my own, and then I can start to invest to create that, like to create that surge. Yeah. And I think that would be in, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I can, I can see how that can become very exciting for you with your, your need for, for a vision and making right. it real. But if I'm just going to be an investor and I'm going to pull out the spreadsheet every month and be like, Oh, look at the, uh, this one went up in price and this one, went, uh, that's, I mean, that's like, I stab my eyeballs out. I don't even know why people do that. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but they have a vision. That's, I, I love investors. Oh, well, they have a vision. Different people they, do, you know. <laughs> need different things in life, right? So as long as it makes them happy. Yeah, and the vision is a little bit more um, about find, just more generically looking at the financial um, of the like you can make you can have a vision for I don't need to make an impact in an industry or a wor- on the world in that way I can make an, in- an impact on all these mm-hmm. these portfolio companies lives and all the people within them and mm-hmm. there's there's some there's some intriguing things when you mm-hmm. and maybe their vision is actually more wide than mine you know because they they look at they look at impact yeah. In a much wider, yeah. they have a lot larger aperture than mine, where I always want the impact to be like on something very specific. Scott, how do how your motivation changed from the time you started a business until today? What do you think drives you most? Because you mentioned impact and uh, it piqued my curiosity. When you first started the business, what was your motivation for it? There were so many different things that I was starting at the time. Um, I don't even know what, I can't quite remember what was the drive behind, mm-hmm. um, it was an, it was an, an, an impulse. I, I have I had an impulse to just create little, when things popped in my head or I saw mm-hmm. a, a, something, I, I'd create a brand for it, a comp, a website, and then I'd create a small product or service. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, a little portfolio of them. I had a collection of them. I don't know why I can't quite remember why. Um, Over time, I grew to become an expert in certain ones. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then I started to fall in love with the nuances Mm -hmm. of the ones that I understood well. Mm -hmm. And so levels that I wasn't born with the pacifier being stuck in my mouth about construction payment challenges, right? And, and and a love for that. But as I worked more around it and kept coming up with more things with it, I started to understand it more deeply and then started to fall in love with the, with the nuances of mm-hmm. it. And that made me care about the impact that I made with it. And so over time, I started to want that impact and want that, that, um, that vision to come to be of how I saw Mm -hmm. this, the nuances Mm -hmm. of this problem, how I saw them getting solved and I wanted to solve it. Um, and that's kind of one of the challenges of resetting and you say, well, how does that, well, what is your motivation now? Mm -hmm. Now I don't have financial motivations. I'm not in the business of being, trying to, you know, to, to be 10 times wealthier than I am or 10 times wealthier than somebody else. Like I'm wealthy enough. Mm-hmm. Um, the, and to a degree, my wealth is such that it's going to be hard for me to impact it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Like, like I can go get a job tomorrow that pays really well and it doesn't really matter. Mm-hmm. All the, all the, the knowledge I have, in the nuances that I fell in love with, I can go back to them, but I feel like I'm called to that sometimes. That little toy of a company that I have is is mm-hmm. connected to that in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't have uh, that. That motivation is lacking. I, I still I, I don't. I'm I'm not locked into that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is challenging like the that what motivates me today is kind of a challenging thing because it's it's i don't i haven't fallen into the 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 motivation around any particular lane this uh, cognitive overload which leads to our decision paralysis and then we're just stuck there until we, we get out that's what that, that's and like I said earlier, you're not going to find motivation on a rocking chair. You're mm-hmm. I'm not going to find level set thinking about what to do. Mm-hmm. I found level set because I started to um, I started to dance with a problem. Mm-hmm. 
that I started to get smarter about. So um, that is definitely, I, I, as, I, as I think about what I want to do with the next three years or five years or 10 years, to the extent that I want to, where I need to feel that purpose, have that paradox of purpose and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and I need to feel it. I do know that I have to get my hands. Mm -hmm. I need to get pots on the stove. Yeah. If I don't have pots on the stove, I'm never going to find that purpose. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how, how you see it because it, it kind of aligns with what I found for myself as a way to reignite my motivation and that's inspiration. I like to think of inspiration as this tool that ignites my energy because essentially what inspiration does, it creates desire, right? We suddenly want something, we get inspired, we want something, we get all this dopamine rush, we have all this energy. And if uh, it hits something inside of us, some need, like a need to create, for example, it can sustain itself for some time. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Then yeah. we just have a little bit of fun and joy around it. But inspiration is an interesting thing because the, this, the most powerful inspiration we get from other people, which, which naturally leads us to think, okay, we need to be very careful about whom we allow to inspire us. It's like this social curation in a way, which leads me to my next question, which is how do you choose those people to surround yourself with? For the first 40 years of my life, the people that I was surrounding myself with was very organically developed. Mm -hmm. um, and with level set, you, you have this, you have something that is driving is the, it's driving the car to go find more people in the space, to mm -hmm. find investors, to find partners, to find team members and leaders and part. So, when I had this thing and, and a variety of things that was driving people to me, I found myself, I guess, talented or good, or, or, um, I found my mag, my, like my compass worked mm -hmm. to know which ones challenged me and pushed me and intellectually mm -hmm. got me to new areas mm -hmm. and made me grow. Now I feel like the assembly of, um, of who I am around a lot is very inorganic mm -hmm. um, because I don't have anything driving me to, to like, to find people to even like, um, to, 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 to connect with. And, and so there's mm -hmm. nothing I don't have a reason to go mm -hmm. see somebody once a week or, or three mm -hmm. times a week. There's a very, so now if I wanted to assemble, a team, a group of people to challenge me or to help me grow, mm -hmm. it would be a very awkward assembly. I have nothing to assemble them to. What am I supposed to do? Right? Like have a, have a, have a, um, a dinner, like, like, a, you know, like what is it in, um, the, um, midnight in Paris movie where F Scott Fitzgerald and, and, um, Ernest Hemingway and all these people get together and, what am I supposed to do? Like put together little like intellectual parties. That would be very awkward. And, and this, so I have nothing to bring together these people to do. But we kind of have to do it. We cannot not do it because it, it would be similar to, you know, not dating uh, uh, ever because we don't want to go through this initial period, which is not organic. Right? We have yeah. to do it. We have to rebuild um, our social circle around something else that we care about. You can attract great minds without having something that is gravitational pull for them too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like they're not, they're not there to do you a favor. Mm -hmm. They're, you know, you're finding your room of five or 10 people that, that challenge you and help you, but that's only because you're challenging them and helping yeah. them yeah. around something. Of course. So without the something, it's extremely hard. Have you tried joining any organizations? I had some organizations I was a part of doing level set, um, doing, doing certain moments of level set. 
and they were okay and they were helpful in, in, in ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't done one after, after the exit. Um, and maybe there are some out there that, that do this. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there are some out there for post exit founders and blah, blah, blah. I'm sure they have a bunch of, a bunch of different versions of it. Yeah. You have to be open to going and experiencing them. You have to go on those dates still. Yeah. And I'm not opposed to like, exp and, I, and I, my, my calendar gets filled in periodically by a variety of things. And mm -hmm. when I go like to a different city, I, 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 I dial, you know, I fill the calendar with different, mm -hmm. different folks that I've come across. I'm still involved with some old investors. I'm still involved on, I'm on the board of a few companies. Like there's things that keep me, keep the blood pumping in the space that I was in. Yeah. Right. I, I remain, I remain in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not, a, and I'm not opposed to, to more. I, I, I do not like um, not feeling, I, I do not like feeling, I don't like, I like it to be organic. I don't like inorganic situations. Okay, Scott, this has been absolutely amazing. I need to ask you my last question. I always ask the same question at the end of an interview. Okay. And that's, how do you want to be remembered? I thought about that when, uh, you know, I, you know what happens is I think about that one sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then I think, ah, I don't want to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's too complicated. It's okay. Uh, it's it was complicated. It was more it's got Warren Buffett said, Oh, life is easy. You just write your eulogy or you write your um, obituary mm -hmm. and then you spend your whole life trying to live up to that. <laughs> and this gets back to what we said earlier, where after you sell a company, you kind of like go into outer space, you look at the world and you say, Oh, look at this. I'm not that, I'm not that critical. And then mm -hmm. you say, who's going to remember me anyway. Right? Like no one remembers me, but like people don't remember level set anymore. Any, and that was just three years ago. So, I struggle intellectually with the, with the, whenever I feel like someone is, I think, I think it's a lot, e I think it's a lot worse to care a lot about that than it is to not care about that mm -hmm. in a way. Like I think I see a lot of flaws in getting tripped up on what do you want people to remember you mm -hmm. by? And, um, and so I've, I don't really know, but I do, you know, I have my family and I, 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 I guess I care about that. They remember me and they remember, I guess, my point of view or like my, like the way that I, the way that the way that I would, I would, I would, I would hope that their future behaviors and instincts are um, inspired by or instructed by mm -hmm. my point of view, my instincts, and the way that I um, made decisions and, and was able to build things. You're gonna get me into. I don't need to be in this existential quest about all this stuff. It's too, like, it's too much. It's too much. And, and the more you try to solve it, the, the, you're never going to get to the end of this rainbow. And so all it's going to do is make it worse. <laughs> it's a question that kind of reveals whom do you want to become in the foreseeable future? Right. And what I can see yeah. is that you want to dig very deep into that existential crisis before you even consider thinking about it. I want to be in love with the things that I am. I like the feeling of being in love with things. And, um, and I think that if you, what makes me happy is learning really deeply about certain things mm -hmm. and getting very good at certain things and finding flow in certain things. Mm -hmm and having a point of view and trying to get that point of view expressed and out in the world and that dent made in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. I don't even need to be remembered for it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the dent can happen without you being remembered for it. Scott, thank you so much. I, I could just talk to you forever. 
uh, we just need to stop. But but it was a lot of fun. We went very deep, and I'm very very grateful for that. That's exactly how I like it. Uh, the hedgehoggy way, deep okay, with yeah, new right. nuances. Thank you right. so much. Well, 